All right, let's really get going. Fun. Is everyone having fun at PAX this year? <laughs> and then? <laughs> and then. So welcome to the PAX panel for Magic the Gathering this year. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's me, I'm the regional manager. That's Will, he's the brand manager. And returning is our special guest, Mr. Aaron Forsyth, Director of R&D. <laughs> we were going to get him to do it, but he didn't want to dance. <laughs> so last year when we were here, uh, we had our, our friend Garuk. Where is Garuk? There he is. He was hanging out with his buddy Jace. Since then, Garuk's had a bit of a mean streak. And we don't know where Jace has gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cruel. <laughs> uh, the expansion set for Jewels of the Planeswalker comes out this Friday. It'll be available for download. Um, for many of you, you've probably already been past the booth. If you haven't, we've got a fine activity going on. You can get the Sarkhan pin. I can see quite a lot in the crowd already. Uh, just participate in one of the activities, learn to play, intro dueling. Uh, you can try out duels, and in fact, we're previewing the expansion set, so you can come and have a, a try of that. Also get your photo taken, doing something cheesy with a mask on. Or if you're feeling brave, you can play against one of us. We'll happily not let you win. <laughs> Over to Aaron. All right. So last time when I was here, uh, I was giving uh, a panel that was effectively the same as the one that was being given at San Diego, San Diego Comic-Con the same weekend uh, by Mark Rosewater. And I had about 85% of the same content with a few new cards thrown in. But this time, because the two events have been nicely spaced apart, you guys get uh, an exclusive panel full of information that has not been given out anywhere else before. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we, this, is, this is not being streamed live, but the internet sure wants to know about what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, we have a hashtag here on screen, MTG Pax Aus. If, if you're so inclined to take pictures, talk about what we see on social media, please use this hashtag so everybody else can en enjoy the fun as well. All right. So uh, before I get into the stuff that you don't know about, uh, a quick a quick run through of the, the next product that's coming out, which is our latest Commander set that comes out next week. Um, I was on the design team for this set, and the cool, the cool new thing about it is that we have introduced Planeswalkers as Commanders. So I just wanna... <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna run through the five characters quickly and just give a little story about them. Um, Initially, when we were on the, the design team, wanted to use a lot of our existing planeswalkers like Jace and Liliana as the planeswalkers in this product. Um, with a couple new ones, there was a, definitely a, a desire uh, for a goblin planeswalker that the fans have been asking for, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but we wanted, we also wanted to make uh, an equipment-based planeswalker, which we hadn't done yet. Um, so we were going to use a mix of old and brand new. Uh, the creative team, once they saw that we were interested in doing old legends from Magic's years gone by, said, well, we should try doing some Planeswalkers from Magic's years, on, years gone by as well. And so we kind of retrofitted this white core Planeswalker, Nahiri, oop, wrong way, um, into the, pre, the existing story. If any of you are familiar with the story of Zendikar, uh, three Planeswalkers trapped the Eldrazi on Zendikar long, long ago. It was Sorin, uh, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, and a, a mysterious third one called the Lithomancer, which we never really got into who that was. Uh, so when we made this card, it just seemed like a natural fit, a Stoneforge mystic, as it were. Uh, the Lithomancer is a stone mage. So they fit together nicely. So here she is, the Lithomancer. Uh, she is the one that built all of the hedrons that trapped the Eldrazi on Zendikar uh, thousands of years ago. She is not the person pictured on the card stone Forge Mystic, although the core in general are very adept at making weapons. They are, they are definitely from the same kind of family of, of, of mages. So here's this guy, Teferi. Uh, initially, we were going to use Jace in this spot, uh, but Teferi is a character that we really like. Uh, last seen in Time Spiral Block. 
uh, the time mage. Uh, he lost, he gave up his spark to heal the time rifts um, that, that created the mending during the Planeswalker story that kind of created, brought all Planeswalkers down to a more mortal level from the godlike status they had before. Um, but because this product is not really part of any kind of current continuity, we can make cards of Planeswalkers that, that no longer are Planeswalkers, for instance, Teferi here. So he's got a, an awesome ability that lets you use uh, Planeswalker abilities on anyone's turn. This guy, Obnixilis. So many of you are familiar with him. Uh, he was in M15. Uh, he's in the uh, Duels of the Planeswalkers game as well. Uh, and he was in Zendikar as a, as a demon. <clears throat> he was kind of a throwaway character when we first created him in Zendikar. Just, he was called Obnixilis the Fallen. He was a demon. He couldn't fly. And there was a bit of flavor text talking about how he lost his spark. And fans kept writing in and saying, tell us more about this guy. Tell us more about this guy. So we decided to flesh him out more. Uh, in, in this incarnation, when he was a planeswalker, he was human. Uh, he was a warlord and a tyrant on his home plane. Uh, and once he figured out how to planeswalk, he decided he was going to try to take over uh, more planes in the multiverse. To do that, he got his hands on the chain veil, the kind of nefarious artifact that Garrick and Liliana have been wrestling over, uh, and it turned him into a demon. Uh, he went to Zendikar to try to cure that curse, um, and that is where he became trapped and uh, lost his wings as well as his ability to planeswalk. So that, well, that's when we saw him on Zendikar. Uh, and then he got his wings back and could fly uh, in M15. And we have not seen the last of Obnixilis, but this is kind of his pre-cursed version back when he was a human. So here's uh, Duretti, the goblin. He is from the plain of Fiora, which we showed in the, uh, what the heck was it called? Conspiracy, sorry. Drew blank. I was going to say commander, but no. Uh, conspiracy, right. Uh, the home plane of Dak Faden, the greatest thief in the multiverse. Uh, we have, people have been bombarding us with requests for a goblin planeswalker. Uh, and, so we, and we also liked uh, Goblin Welder, is a, is a card a lot of us in the office enjoy playing with. So we tried to make an uh, a planeswalker version of that card. And that's what we ended up with Duretti. So he was... Um, injured badly in the, in the accident that caused him to, to uh, learn how to planeswalk. It looked like he died, but actually he had transported himself to another plane, uh, but had blown uh, his own legs off <laughs> in the process. So he created this kind of uh, mechanical vehicle uh, using his artifact magic that carries him around. And lastly, here's Freilis. Uh She's a character that's been around for a long, long time, since the Ice Age block. Um, originally, this card was designed to be Nyssa. Uh, in fact, this first ability that puts a, a Lana War Elf token in effect into play was uh, on the design version of the Nyssa in M15. But we wanted to kind of distance Nyssa from being an only Elf Matters Planeswalker. The first version of Nyssa that came out back in Zendikar, people liked the character, but the card never really took off. So with our second version of Nyssa, we wanted to distance her from only caring about playing an Elf deck and made her into the one, kind of the, the druidic uh, land matters planeswalker that you have in M15. And so we put this ability on Freilis, who was a protector of the elves back on Dominaria. Uh, she protected the land of war and the Findhorn elves, and later the Sky Shroud elves, once the Plane of Wrath was overlaid on Dominaria. And she died uh, in the, the events of Time Spiral. But again, because we can go back and this set isn't part of a modern continuity, make some cards of, of old characters that people really liked. So those are, that's the story of the Planeswalkers. The product, like I said, comes out uh, next week. But we are having a showcase of it. If you want to come see it being played, or maybe one of you will get lucky enough to be able to play along with us later on today. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that don't know, at 2 o'clock this afternoon at the Magic booth, we'll be showcasing the five new Commander decks in action. So you've seen the cards, you know what they do, but how do they actually play out? Well, you'll get to see Aaron. Uh, piloting his uh, signature green uh, commander deck against uh, four uh, other participants in the, uh, in the showcase, uh, two of which have been selected from uh, lucky uh, participants in the Magic tournaments on the PAX uh, uh, tabletop area. Uh, we'll have a special guest from IGN Asia, uh, Max Valandre, the uh, publishing director. And the last slot, which uh, we have yet to fill, is going to be selected from right here in this panel. Yeah. Now, 
Yeah. Will is closely looking, monitoring all of you and picking his favorite person. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so be nice when I'm up on stage later, all right? <laughs> but also, um, I think uh, if you ask some great questions when it comes time to the Q&A session, that's going to give you a, a very good shot at getting that slot. So a um, oh yeah, little hint. OK, so here's a product you don't know about yet. So once a year we do a dual deck that is uh, kind of an intro to the newest block, and once a year we do one that's a battle between two planeswalkers that's trying to play off a story from the previous year. Uh, now in Theros, Elspeth did not actually ever battle Kiora, so this is a bit more of a, a what-if scenario. They don't really like each other, so it's certainly possible that they could battle, uh, but you'll get to play that out. And uh, I mean, these are some very powerful planeswalkers that I'm sure most of you have experienced playing against in standard. Uh, and this is awesome new artwork that's going to go on them. Uh, and kind of to commemorate uh, this product, which comes out in February, we have a, a, a giveaway. What is a con without some cool tchotchkes, after all? So we'll be passing out the uh, inflatable Elspeth swords. <laughs> <laughs> when, when is that happening at the end? Yeah. So uh, these swords will be passed out to you as you leave the panel in about now is time. So you'll be all G'd up from all the exciting new stuff you've seen. So you're going to get these swords. You're going to run out and charge around the, the whole PAX area, belting people Excellent. in the name of magic. <laughs> uh, here's the art for uh, Kiora. Yeah, it's fantastic art. Um, and then I will sh there's going to be four other cards uh, with, with new alternate art in the decks, I'll show you the art and leave it to you to speculate as to what those cards may be. So here's the first one. That is not a land card. That is a, <laughs> it is a spell. <laughs> All right, the third one here. Therese Nielsen, she's a fan favorite artist for sure. And the last one here. I believe this one is a land card. So. All right, so guess away and you'll see if you're right in a few weeks. <laughs> All right, so who has enjoyed uh, Cons of Tarkir so far? Yeah. Uh, so over the next few months, we have a lot more story to tell in, set on the plane of Tarkir. Uh, and the next chapter, uh, which will be coming out early in 2015, is a set called Fate Reforged. Yeah. It's a small expansion, uh, like most of our second sets. Um, and it's set a thousand years in the past from where Khans of Tarkir is set. Here is kind of a, <laughs> what we call a pivotal moment in the storyline there. So if you can take a peek right above uh, the Fate Reforged logo, right past the E in Fate, there's a tiny figure down by that rock outcropping holding his staff. That is Sarkhan. Uh, how he got in a plane, now going back in time is not something that planeswalkers can typically do. So how he got there uh, is a story to be told on our website in our Uncharted Realms column. Uh, I, th I believe on December 10th is where we're, where we're gonna tell that story. But, <laughs> fans of Uncharted Realms, that's great. Uh, but, but suffice to be said, he is back in time. Uh, he is there to try to change the outcome of this one moment, which was Nicol Bolas killing the spirit dragon, Ugin. And it's on a magic card. <laughs> so you see the flavor text kind of speaks to that story point that uh, Sarkinval had to go back in, in the past to change what happened and what made Tarkir into what it is today. 
the rules text, very awesome. I'm sure many of you have seen there's been some blue-black control decks showing up in standard that will really benefit from this card. And you might wonder, why would we put destroy all dragon creatures uh, when to date there have been zero dragons in the block? Well, that, you know, that's a, a, a clue as to what may be coming. <laughs> Uh, here's another piece of art from the set. So, in the past, there are still the five clans, and they are still each uh, ruled by cons. Uh, the, the clans are not fighting each other all the time as they are in the present, uh, but they are constantly fending off the legion hordes of dragons that are terrorizing this world, an unending stream of, of predatory menaces. Uh, this is the, the leader of the teamer. Uh, from a thousand years ago. So e each of the clans uh, is kind of based on uh, a, a, an Asian culture uh, from, from, from Earth, uh, loosely, the architecture and some of the clothing and whatnot. So uh, the Mardu, for instance, uh, are based off the Mongol horde. Uh, the Jeskai are based off the Shaolin monks. The Abzan are based off the Ottoman Turks. Uh, the Saltai are based off of uh, kind of the Cambodian uh, steamy jungle pleasure palaces. and that leaves the, the teamer are, are based off uh, Siberia, where they have, even to today, a kind of long-lasting, shamanistic, uh, rugged culture. So her name, Yasova, oh. <laughs> sounds very Russian. And she is, uh, th this set, because the, the clans are not as clearly defined as they are now, a thousand years ago, the set does not contain actual three-colored gold cards. So we wanted to show off the wedges in a way that still had to, it clear that she's a member of the teamer, but could still be played in a, in a couple different decks. So her color identity, for you commander fans out there, is teamer, blue, red, and green. Uh, but we're using these hybrid uh, ability costs to allow you to play her and get full use out of her in either a red-green deck or a blue-green deck. And we're doing that a lot in this set. There's a few different ways in which we kind of show that the cards have a three-color allegiance without making them actual three-color gold cards. So the way you're going to draft this set uh, is first one pack of Fate Reforged and then two packs of Cons. So you'll, you'll, you'll have a little more flexibility picking a card like Yasova early and not having to commit yourself to a three-color deck uh, to get this powerful effect. And you'll get your first taste of that at the pre-release. Over to Will. Thank you, everyone. Pre-release. Who loves going to pre-release? Yeah. yeah! It's awesome, right? You get to see the new cards, you get to play with them. You even get like awesome cosplayers sometimes dressing up. I mean, look at these guys here. These guys all love pre-release. And just a special mention because uh, Soren here is just so awesome. Soren, can you stand up for us and just yeah! show us a question? <laughs> Holy crap, how good is that? How awesome is that? <laughs> Thanks, Soren. Much appreciated. All right, so the pre release. So, as Aaron mentioned, the story is all about Sarkinvol traveling back in time uh, to to try and prevent the spirit dragon Ugin from being, you know, killed off by Bolas. Now, uh, at the Fate Reforged pre-release, you'll be following in Sarkin's footsteps to see uh, if you're able to help him attempt to alter fate. Now, much like um, in Khans of Tarkir, you'll be able to select your clan with which to, uh, to align with and fight for. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, Sultai is the best clan. Yeah! Yeah. Oh, I'm not getting much love here. <laughs> That's right. You're my brother. <laughs> okay, so once you've picked your clan, you're going to jump into the actual pre-release activities themselves. So as you battle um, in the, uh, the pre-release, you'll uh, aim to complete three achievements on your pre-release activity card. Now, if you're successful, you'll heal Ugin. <coughs> And as part of healing Ugin, you'll gain a glimpse of the future. Now, that glimpse comes in the form of 
two, uh, an Ugin's Fate booster. And this is a, a special boost that you'll get as a reward for completing your achievements at the pre-release uh, events. Inside the uh, booster, you get uh, two alternative art cards. You get one token card and one land card. Now, the token card and the land card are uh, regular art cards. Well, the, the land actually is showing uh, what the world looked like a thousand years ago. So they are uh, different basic lands than what you've seen before. Oh, thank you very much, yeah. Aaron. I didn't even know that. Spoilers. It's <laughs> awesome. What else did I know? <laughs> um, now, the, uh, the pool of cards you get available, it's a pool of 40. So you get a few different cards, uh, uh, alternate bath cards. Um, who wants to have a look at what the booster looks like? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, I, was that enthusiastic? I, I don't I think don't they... Know. I, they didn't Ooh. enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's better! Ooh. <laughs> Sideways, yeah. Yeah. Did I hear someone say, what's inside the booster? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ready, set, get your cameras ready. Oh. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Smart demonstrous. But what was it like a thousand years ago? Oh. You got some new targets now. <laughs> okay. Want another one? All right, let's go. Briber's Purse from Khan's. Victory is certain. The price negotiable. That's what the sales guy said to me when I was buying my engagement ring for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and the new art. The bigger the hand, the higher the price. Sales guy also said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible. <laughs> but thank you for laughing. <laughs> and another one, Ghost Fireblade. Oh, what's it look like a thousand years ago? Ooh. Can you see the difference? That's right, a thousand years ago, everybody was left-handed. Oh, and there's a dragon there as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that is Fate Reforged, and that's what you guys get to look forward to in early January. It's going to be summer. Everyone's on uni break and school break. Make sure you guys pop into your local WPN store and have a blast. <laughs> Back over to Aaron. So the, uh, the, the 40 cards that you can get as a part of this uh, Ugin's Fate Booster, uh, a lot of them are from Cons of Tarkir. There are some as well from Fate Reforged uh, with different art than what appears in the set. Uh, and there's uh, even a Mythic Rare that, that could show up in there as well. So a whole variety of different things you could get. So you know, get to the pre-release and, and, and see what uh, the future holds. So uh, before we get to the, to the Q&A, um, what does the future hold? Well, I mean, I believe all signs are very clearly pointing to what the future holds. So the set after Fate Reforged, if you haven't guessed, is Dragons of Tarkir. Yeah! It is a large set. Uh, we will be returning to the present uh, after uh, Sarkon has done his duty in the past to try to save Ugin and see exactly what changing the past does. Uh, which is not always what you hope it does. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So that's all the goodies. Uh, we're going to move on to a Q&A session. So we have, oh, I don't know, uh, about 15 or 20 minutes for that. Uh, so if you guys have questions, there's a mic in the center. You can line up. I do, as you line up, though, I do want to say thank you to Will and Dale and their team for putting together this panel and... It's all for you guys. 
the terrific suite of activities that they have going on here at Pax for Magic. It is so heartwarming to me to see just how many people are here playing, learning to play, playing in events, coming by and spell singing against me, coming to this panel. This is just tremendous. Australia is an awesome, awesome magic playing country, and I love coming here and seeing it. And let's have some questions. All right. <laughs> On. Hello. Hi. Aaron, thanks for coming down. No um, problem. Are we going to get Tamio back anytime soon? <laughs> uh, Tamio is certainly on the uh, list of people that we want to be including in sets going forward. She's still alive. Uh, she's got some cool powers that we want to make cards for. And, you know, I'm sure everyone doesn't want to see Jace every single time we make a blue planeswalker. <laughs> Hi guys, um, I've only been playing Magic for a year and I love the mythology that you guys have put into the stories. I'm a massive fan of Nicobola, so... What's your name? Chris. Hi Chris. Chris, so I'm so psyched um, to see dragons coming back into it. I like the idea of it going back in the past, but I'm really interested to know, with the change going into the future, will we see Nicobolas again? Will we see Nicobolas again? Absolutely. Uh, Nicobolas is, you know, one of the greatest threats to the multiverse. Oh yeah. Uh, and we're not done with him. Uh, there's still a lot of story to be told, and uh, there's probably... I, I, yes, we'll absolutely be seeing Nicol Bolas again. <laughs> awesome, thank you. These are tough questions to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Say it's in the next set. in the next set, that would be awesome. No. <laughs> thank you. He's that in the next set, that would be awesome. They were the easy questions, you realize that. <laughs> Um, this is a bit of an oddball question, but I've uh, recently homebrewed a Magic the Gathering role-playing game. Okay. I've been playing with my friends. Has that ever been on the radar for Wizards of the Coast to release a role-playing game featuring Magic the Gathering uh, storylines? Uh, I know that one was being built many, many years ago, maybe before I even came to the company. I've seen some binders full of the materials they were using to put that together. It comes up now and again. Um, we have a role-playing game that we all know and enjoy, Dungeons and Dragons, um, which is still doing fantastically well, and it's like twice as old as Magic, which is hard to believe. But um, we have not, we we've not discussed crossing the streams, as it were, recently. Uh, we are looking to branch out the kind of games that we offer with Magic. Uh, you may have heard there was a there's a board game in the works from Hasbro. Uh, we hope that goes well, and that probably is going to open the door for us to try all sorts of ways to get our our characters and stories out there in gameplay that is not a traditional trading card. So we'll see. Thanks very much. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you for making the new commander set, by the way. I'm just a big commander player, so that's great for me. Great. Uh, speaking of commander, though, what are your thoughts on the future of making four color commanders? Because that's something that hasn't been explored in the past yet. Right, that's kind of like the last box that has yeah. never been checked as far mm -hmm. as what kind of deck you can build for commander. Yep. Um, Every time we sit down to do a design team for a new commander project, that's the first thing that someone brings up. Why don't we do four color commanders? Okay. We're going to do it someday. We're, just, uh, we're, going to, we're going to cross that bridge at some point. Um, the thing we struggle with, though, is there's not a lot to differentiate one set of four colors from another set of four colors. Like with, with two colors, you really get differentiation between the different two color combinations. With three colors, you can get a decent amount of differentiation between the, th the three colors. But you know, everything but blue is not a whole lot different than everything but black. Uh, so we have to crack that nut is to ha give, find a good way to deliver that content in a way that they feel unique and separate enough that they're not just all the decks are just this hodgepodge of the best spells in Magic, but there's a, a good theme to it. Uh, okay. In the next couple of years, I'm sure we'll, that, that's the way we're going to go. OK, good to hear. Hi, I'm Mark. Hello, Mark. Um, I really enjoy the uh, cooperative uh, styles of games like Arch Enemy and Two-Headed Giant and stuff. I was wondering if there's any plans for like a two versus one or two versus three format in the future? Uh, we haven't discussed those kind of combinations of, of two on one or two versus three. Uh, we did get a lot of good feedback on the stuff we did for game day for the Theros block, which was kind of one or more versus zero effectively, face the Hydra and whatnot, uh, the kind of what we call PVE, uh, where there's no, no human opponent. Um, and we are going to continue to support Two-Headed Giant. Um, 
Arch Enemy as a product did not, you know, blow the doors off to the degree that, that something like Conspiracy has. So uh, that one's not not uh, on the calendar for any in time in the foreseeable future. But uh, you know, we'll have to talk about whether or not there's some interesting. We do like when people talk to each other playing Magic. Too much of Magic, in my opinion, is silent. Uh, you know, staring and, and giving nothing away. When you get into these playing with teammates formats, it is super fun to be able exactly, to have table yeah. talk and, and get into it a little bit more. So we want to promote that style of play for sure. Yeah. But as far as a product, uh, that's something we'll, we'll have to put some thought into. Cool. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Hash. I just would want to talk about something I think Mark Rosewater mentioned. Uh, he said that when you guys were going forward releasing land cycles, you'd release them as a full set. And uh, I think this was before M15, and then M15, half the pain lands came out. And now in Khan's half the fetch lands have come out. Yep. Is there any chance that you guys will release the other half in the rest of Khan's block? Well, there's chances for everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Is it likely? I, I, I mean... You're not going to get me to tell you yes or no if anything uh -huh. is in an upcoming set that I haven't showed you in the slideshow. Yeah. Um, uh, what uh, about the policy itself? Is that something? Yeah, it's not that, a policy. And, and, uh, and obviously, I mean, Mark says things, and then other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a over 40 person team, uh, many of which make a lot of decisions that do not involve Mark. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Painlands were a good example. There's, there's not the other five, they're just they're nowhere to be found. Uh, so the fetch lands may or may not fall into that category as well. It is, there is, we want to make sure that there are equal numbers of lands for each color combination. So you have the you know, windswept heath it, yep. cycle for allied, and you have the caves of Koilos pain land cycle for enemy to make sure that there's the same number of lands, uh, even if they're of different cycles or different quality, to make sure that bu building decks of all the different color combinations is possible. So that's what I think Mark meant to say. <laughs> uh, so take that as you will. So you'll, you'll see the future when it comes. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you. Hi. Um, I'm actually one of the moderators of a Magic the Gathering Facebook page, so I actually asked the community to see if they had any questions to put up to you. Um, first off, one thing they all wanted to say was that they love what you guys at Wizards do for the game. Great. And Thank I think you. that's a sentiment that can, that can be um, shared with um, everyone that's presently here. Um, one question was... Um, um, well, actually, one question that was put out was... Um, now that there's been the talk of getting rid of the core set, what will you guys be doing for newer players to bring them in? Because obviously the core set was a good way to bring new players in. It was a simpler way to bring them, bring them in, simple <coughs> rules, et cetera. Right. Now that that's going away, what do you guys plan to do for them? Right. So on paper, it seemed like it should have been an awesome way to get new players into the game. But it, it, the truth is that we are adding new players all the time, mm -hmm. every month of the year. Uh, Any time uh, a new set comes out, no matter what it was, I was just talking to a guy whose first play experience was Dragon's Maze, and what a nightmare that was for him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, we, Duels of the Planeswalkers has and, and does and will continue to be our best way uh, from a product standpoint to make something that people are going to be able to learn the game from. Yeah. Uh, it's been great for us, and we're going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I chime in on that as well. I mean, the fact that you're a moderator of a Facebook group yes. and you manage a community, yeah. um, that is also one of the best ways to bring new players mm. in. And that's something that we as a, as a company can't really do. And we love that you guys, there's so many communities out there that kind of mm. facilitate these new players. I mean, to be honest, you guys are our, our best ambassadors for the game. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So, well, to, fin to finish the answer, um, we are rejiggering the rest of, what, of our product lineup apart from the booster releases. So the things like intro packs, uh, deck builders toolkits, things like that, they're all getting a, a bit of a tweak, fat packs, to make sure that they are uh, better on ramps uh, for new players so that we have stuff like that available all year round uh, and not just hope that you start in the summer when we have a simpler set available. Uh, so duels, uh, into one of those kind of introductory products, and then hopefully a friendly store environment, <laughs> which I cannot stress enough, is 
a more important ingredient to getting someone to transition into an actual magic player than any insert we could write, any grizzly bear we could put in an intro pack. You know, making sure that the people that you encounter as you're learning to play the game are helpful and friendly is going to be the, the best thing for, for getting more and more magic players over time. Um, Chris, first of all, thank you for coming here. It's really great to see you guys here. Um, so my question is, do you uh, ever introduce a mechanic you really regret introducing to the game, and why? <laughs> yeah. There's probably a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. I mean, all things in moderation, I think, are fine. Um, like, I think any mechanic can go from bad to kind of cute and niche to oppressive, just depending on what mana cost we put on the cards that have them. Um, I think Cascade, for me, is my biggest regret, because in my head, it was so much more fun uh, than how it actually turned out. Um, it, it was supposed to have this kind of random, who knows what you're going to get feel to it as you flipped over cards from the top of your deck. But then the way the decks ended up being built, that you would cast Bloodbraid Elf, and there's only about two or three different things that you were going to get when you actually started flipping the cards, and all of them were pretty disgusting and gross and not that fun. So um, <laughs> it was not this kind of wacky, who knows? It's more like, here's a 3-2 haste, and discard two cards and take three damage every single time. And uh, people got tired of that real fast. So it did not, that did not match the kind of design intent in my head. And just a really quick one. Will I ever see dinosaurs in Magic? Dinosaurs. That is really contentious. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you do, I imagine it would be part of some larger world. I cannot imagine world full of dinosaurs as, as a set theme because <laughs> dinosaurs don't do anything. You know, it's like seven, six vanilla, nine, ten vanilla, four, five <laughs> vanilla. Uh, so they, they don't cast particularly interesting spells. <laughs> but, but you could have Garrick riding a dinosaur. What's that? Yeah, we could do somebody riding a dinosaur, and there's been a little bit of that. Um, <laughs> yes, dinos yeah. dinosaur wizards, right. Yeah. right. Allosaurus rider, I think, was kind of that. It's, I mean, that's just a way to make an elf uh, a 9 9. But, uh, <laughs> it, that, I mean, we talk about thing, things people ask for. Most things people ask for, we're like, okay, sure, we could probably do that. Okay, sure, we will do that. And when, I, when the creative team hears people are asking for dinosaurs, they go, ugh. <laughs> oh, so thank, it's gonna be you. a tough one. <laughs> All right, yeah, I have to ask this: um, Are we you ever gonna to. see Felgriffs again, or are they <laughs> extinct? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not think Feldegriff uh, is gonna be showing no. up much more. <laughs> and um, also, my final point is: Did you purposely design the Teemo logo to look like a penguin? <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, there was a guy at work that, as soon as we finalized them and sent them off, had his uh, desktop of his computer that with a little eyeball drawn on it to look like a penguin. And our art director was slapping his forehead, going, oh, "Why didn't you point this out earlier?" So no, that was that was not intentional. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Don. Great. I've. I've Questions about three cards, but specifically one that you've just released in Cannes, which uh -huh. has made very little effect on Standard and Limited, but has absolutely, air quotes, destroyed Eternal formats, and that's Treasure Cruise. What happened there? Was that a card intended for the Eternal formats, or was it just kind of you guys trying to shake it up a bit, or kind of what, what happened there? All right, I'm going to emergency ban questions about Treasure Cruise. <laughs> No, no, uh, in all seriousness. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, people either don't hear it or don't believe it, but we don't test older formats. We just don't have uh, the time or manpower for car you know, the hundreds of cards we're making to see how they're, what they're going to do. Was it discussed as something this probably will get played? Absolutely. Uh, the, the card is fine in standard. In fact, it's probably not even good enough to get serious play in standard. It's interesting and limited. Um, but we have the, pro the banned and restricted lists to clean up things that get slipped through the cracks in older formats. That said, I don't know what's going to happen with that card or Dig Through Time or Jeskai Ascendancy or anything like that until we get to that point in the process, which is going to be right before Fate Reforged comes out when we'll have enough tournament data 
uh, not this kind of sky is falling, oh my god, a new deck has shown up and it beat me and you better ban something. Um, <clears throat> new cards come out and they make new decks. So we hope that's what happens. Uh, and then little people will have to respond and see if they can beat those decks or if the environment can handle those decks. If they can't, if too many people are playing the card or if it's putting too unhealthy of pressure and pushing things out uh, and making the format too homogenous, we'll absolutely take action. Uh, that said, the discussions we've had internally about it are someone write down treasure crews on the list of things we want to talk about when it comes time to actually talk about it, which is going to be a couple of months from now. You had two more cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey there. Hi there. Um, I love the world building that you guys do. So my question is about the world building process. Sure. Tarkia is a bottom up world, not top down. So Tarkia isn't to Asian mythology as Thervos is to Greek mythology. Yet right. despite that, Tarkia has some really, really resonant cards, right? Like the Mardu captured the whole Mongol raiding thing, pillaging thing so well. And the Jeskai have a lot of really, really resonant martial arts tropes, like deflecting palm or flying crane technique. Right. So right. My, my question is, um, when you guys have really resonant cards like that, do you guys, like how do you guys choose whether to use it in Tarkia or not? Do you guys go, hey, let's, let's hold back on this card because we're going to need it for when we do our top-down Asian mythology martial arts world, or do you guys go, hey, let's use it in Tokyo, we'll worry about it when we get there? So those cards were made once we had decided that we were doing that kind of Asian-themed world. So it's a very iterative process. Sometimes we're starting with, you know, Innistrad and Theros were both, let's start from this, this concept, this, this vibe, this feel, this setting. Uh, cons, we actually started from, let's make an interesting draft environment where you're going to draft the middle set with both the first large set and the third large set. And then you know, that, that does not inform very much at all about what the actual cards are. Uh, but it started us down this, well, what's a mechanic that we can use across three sets and that's going to change over time? And we settled on morph. And then we talked about, we were looking at what else we were going to flesh the set out. And, and wedge set was something that was being asked for constantly on social media and on Mark Rosewater's Tumblr. <laughs> and then once we got to there, um, the creative team had a bunch of world ideas that we went through and they settled on this kind of you know, uh, melange of different Asian cultures. And then, then from there, we actually started making cards. So once we got to, it, it's, it's total back and forth and it, I love the way it works. Uh, tons of creative people figuring out how to solve problems and make awesome magic cards. And I'm glad you picked up on it. Right. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hello. Um, is it possible to see a Planeswalker from Lorwyn, or is that style of world just too goofy to see in other settings, like Tamiyo is in Innistrad? Right, uh, Tamiyo is from Kamigawa, yeah. uh, and she showed up in Innistrad. Um, I believe it is possible. Um, I mean, Lorwyn is not a, a, a taboo subject by any means. Uh, there's a couple cards in Commander that are, that are uh, kind of set in lore one. So we're certainly willing to acknowledge its existence um, and, and use stuff from it where appropriate. Um, obviously, there are no humans on Lorwyn, so it would have to be one of the, the, eight, the eight tribes. Uh, and I, it, it seems totally on, on the table for us to one day create a character that's a planeswalker from that world. Cool. Sure. Thanks. Hey. Um, so I absolutely love planeswalkers, and um, I love the lore behind them. Yeah. So I'm curious, what would be your favorite planeswalker just based on the lore, not necessarily the cards that came from it? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's no, no guarantee of that. Um, based on their lore, I, I think... I think that's tough. A lot of the stories we haven't, I know them and we haven't told them very well yet, so I want to kind of <laughs> watch what I answer here. Um, I feel like you're asking him which one of his children is his yeah, favorite. I, I mean, <laughs> how, how, do you do, how do you answer that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to say Venser. Um, I, I, I love when we can tie the kind of older magic stories into the modern era of planeswalkers uh, and the fact that Venser was effectively a martyr uh, and died, you know, a very tragic character. Uh, and I liked, I liked his abilities as well, uh, both his legend and his planeswalker. Uh, so that, that's my answer for now. Uh, and then a year from now or, or even later when we finally get around to 
digging further into some of our more established characters' backstory, I'll probably have a different answer for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, just, uh, I just wanted to start off by saying congratulations and thank you for the Commander 14 set. It looks amazing, and every list I've so far read has at least one card that makes me go, wow, that's awesome. Great. Um, I wanted to know, sort of on the back of the four-color question, what other ideas were you looking at for the commander sets now that we've done wedges, shards, and monocolored? What other things could we uh, see? In well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, we're going to keep making these things as long as people are interested in them, so we've got a, a queue of ideas, uh, whether it's just different color combinations or uh, obviously we did the uh, commanders that affect the game while they're in the command zone. I thought that was a pretty neat uh, innovation uh, a year ago. And then we did Planeswalkers. So we're, we're trying to come up with neat little ways to, to, to tweak the format a little bit and, and show off some of the design space available to it. Um, there's a, there's some, some cool ones in the queue, but I, I got to keep them under my hat for now. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, my question is, uh, with the upcoming Magic movie, do you guys um, anticipate an expansion or diversification or change in your target market? And um, if so, do you have any plans or uh, preparations in, in place to adjust your communications or targeting of, the most, of those markets? The movie is still a, a bit of a dream. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that have to go right between now and when I'm in line with my ticket <laughs> to go watch it. Um, but knowing that you know there's whatever percent chance you want to give it, it, it just like there's whatever percent chance of any of any Hollywood project getting actually greenlit and get a director and a cast and crew and all that stuff. Um, but we've had a lot of discussions, but not any real reason to start formalizing that yet. Uh, we've been looking into a lot of what's happened with other properties, such as when uh, the X-Men movie first came out from Marvel Comics. We hear a lot about how the movie was awesome. It kind of brought X-Men to a new audience, but it didn't do much for sales of the comic book. And trying to use that as a bit of a cautionary tale. Or Transformers, even from Hasbro, that you know, the huge spike in stuff that it's doing for that brand, but was it sustainable or not? That you know, we're we're looking at what other companies have done and the people Please that don't were... change your product. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're, like change your communication. We. <laughs> We don't want to turn our backs on our existing audience. That's why we're here. That's why you know the PAX is full of gamers, and that's who the product is ultimately for. Um, if we can like give ourselves a better image uh, or slightly broader exposure and make it seem like something that you know, hey, there's no reason why you and all your friends shouldn't be trying out this game. That's what we're hoping to get out of it. Not like let's make the game more for 50-year-old grandma. You know? Uh, so no, no. Thanks. Thanks. So much. <laughs> yep. Hi. Being dressed as Feldgriff, that guy back there, sort of stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. So, um, can you tell me a mechanic that you struggled with to fit to the lore, or lore that you've struggled to fit to a mechanic? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, so, there are definitely mechanics such as Kicker, which we saw uh, return in Alara Block, where the creative team just says, there's nothing here. Like this is not a, a creative element. It's just a gameplay element. We're not going to try to say. And then the the kicker mages arrived or whatever. You know that just <laughs> you know, stuff like cycling. Um, it, it's 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 such an abstract game concept that it's hard to describe in a in a in a story in a story term. Um, so often it is find the ones that really resonate. Write that into the story ignore the rest of them. Um, and that happens That happens a decent amount. I think we're happier, though, when we can do things like Morbid in Innistrad. Uh, or even Scry was brought back in Theros because you know, it fit the, the kind of oracles and, and peering into the future that was going on in that world. So we're very conscious of it. Uh, and instead of trying to make a bad fit, oftentimes we'll just not try to make a fit at all and just don't even talk about it in those terms. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Hi. Um, just a, a card that's been kind of like being discussed in the past by uh, Mark Rosewater has been Barry's Land, um, the colorless, uh, the concept of a colorless basic land. Um, previously, there was issues with it in regards to the rules. Um, would there be any chance of a possibility of it being printed for like a colorless commander set or for like colorless commander like decks and other? So you're asking about the existence of a colorless basic land? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, We've had some interesting discussions about where the right place to deploy that is. Um, 
we know that people are asking for it, and we know the colorless commander decks are, are a thing that people like to build. Uh, <laughs> and we just printed a card called Wave of Vitriol that destroys every permanent they have in play, basically. And they, all they need is a basic land type to not have that uh, ruin their day. So um, yes, I think we've got a, a rule solution, uh, just based on some discussions we've had recently. Now figure out where to put that. Uh, one day, if we do a colorless commander deck, I'm sure it'll go in there. Uh, and if we can get it in somewhere else as well. I mean, it's, it's definitely another thing. When people ask for something enough, we want to deliver it to them. And that's one that they've been asking for a lot. So we've we got to figure out how to do it. All right, cool. Thanks for that. So we are over. I don't know how long we get to hang out here. Don't. We, we don't. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Two more questions, and uh, sadly, that's, that's all the time we have. OK. You heard the man. No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd just like to ask how you go about balancing for combo in the next set, you know, bar banning and restricting, what you do to, uh, to the next set to compensate for competitive play. The next set? The next set. So. If you're looking at cards, you know what you do to the next set to try and restrict it. Do you remove any cards, or do you limit what colors are being predominantly played? Uh, to to prevent combo decks from being too good. Yeah. From. In in which format? In standard, sorry. Um. So I d I think the where combo decks are right now in standard, which mostly is just the Jeskai ascendancy combo uh, that uh, made the top eight of the last Pro Tour, is in a really healthy spot. If you are not prepared for it, it can beat you. Uh, but if you don't want to lose to it, it's possible to sideboard enough cards or just a few cards to make sure that it doesn't win. And it's not a huge overwhelming force in the metagame. I think that's the right spot for combo in standard. Uh, and I'm not actually particularly worried uh, about combo getting more prevalent. Uh, so we just kind of used our normal processes. Uh, we, we knew Jeskai Ascendancy had potential to do something weird. Uh, it did, and I think it, we, we got Fortunate that it ended up in just the right spot from where we wanted it to be in standard. Now, in, in modern, it's clearly doing much crazier things that may or may not have to be addressed later. Uh, but uh, I, I have no fear that our normal processes are going to have combo in, in the right spot going forward. Thank you. All right, last question. No pressure. Make it a good one. Does the colors of mana that you use define um, your personality, or does your personality define what kind of colors of mana that you use? <laughs> we'll ask for it. Yeah. Uh... Because like you've had things in the past where it's gone like black mana sort of corrupts, but then again, you've had things where it's like, oh, green mana, I'm just like green. So which one is so it? I, I think your personality dictates the colors of mana you use. Uh, especially early in your magic playing career, kind of when you're first putting your first couple of decks together or just getting your uh, collection in built. More of a law sort of thing as well. What's that? In more of a law sort of way? Oh, oh, oh. You don't mean in, <laughs> you don't mean <laughs> real humans. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me think about that for one second. Um, <laughs> While you think about that, um, so apologies to the people behind you that uh, don't get a chance to answer a question, but uh, Group, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing some of that loot with them, that'd be great. So a lot of times the colors of magic that you're using, I believe, is not even a, a conscious choice. It's just a, if, if you, you have an innate ability to wield certain kinds of magic, uh, you can study other kinds of magic as well. Uh, but I guess I'm going to say that it is mostly your personality dictates what you were drawn to uh, as types of magic. Cool. Interesting question. Uh, I'm probably not the, the best authority on that, that particular one, but I'll, I'll should send it to Doug Beyer uh, on his Tumblr page, and he'll have a much more eloquent and detailed answer than I can give you there. It's a good question. Thanks. All right. Um. Thanks, everyone. This is great. Okay, guys, so uh, I did say at the start of this panel that uh, well, there'll be one lucky participant from here that gets to uh, join us on the Commander Showcase this afternoon. And uh, I think uh, the person uh, who asked the, uh, the, the, the most interesting or challenging question, I think uh, we'd like to have them join us on the, uh, on the showcase. And uh, I think uh, the most uh, <laughs> awkward question, I, well, maybe not awkward, it's not a good word, but... Uh, <laughs> Asking which one of your children was uh, your favorite, I think, oh. yeah. I mean, um, can I have the person who asked that question please uh, stand up? 
Yeah, that was right. her. Great. Well, congratulations. Uh, we'd love to see you at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. Would you like to stay back? Just stay here. Yeah, yeah oh. absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. I will beat you at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> big words, big words. And we're done. So um, as you guys um, exit to the right of myself or your left, um, please remember to pick up your uh, Elspeth sword and charge. <laughs>